Happy Friday, everyone. Not sure if anybody's going to get to join today, but um, I wanted to come on earlier, but it just didn't happen. Let me swipe the camera. Good morning. Hey, Selena. There you are. Yay, you made it. <laughs> yes. We were just talking on Instagram. So, hey. So today, after seeing all of the wonderful nature study posts that have been going on lately, yay! Um, I've been inspired to share my own story of how um, I became to be have such an interest in nature study myself. Um, yes, we are a Charlotte Mason homeschool family, but the love of nature study started for me much longer before I even heard of Charlotte Mason. Let me start with my introduction. Oh, I, I've never remembered to welcome replay viewers, so welcome replay viewers. This is only my fourth or fifth scope, so bear with me. I'm still learning. But my name is Hilda Rebecca. My last name is Manriquez. So many people have asked and been scared to pronounce it because my, my tag is H5 Manriquez. So that's how you say my last name. <laughs> but my name is Hilda Rebecca. I do most of my social networking on Instagram. And I'm just learning about Periscope and really enjoying the community here as well. I have joined Homeschool Scopes. I heard it was .tv. I kept on forgetting to do that. A wonderful Facebook um, group. Very encouraging. And just, hey, there you are. I've been seeing you a lot on here. What is your first name? J2 Thorn. <laughs> Jen. I'll try to remember. I'm horrible with names, but I'll try to remember. And I just recently joined, I have been enjoying Leah Bowden's post, but I joined her Facebook group as well. And there are several people that linked to their, uh, their um, that they're going to be posting about nature study as well. So this is really great. We're going to have a lot of good nature study posts. My blog is very new. I, I used to blog a long time ago, but ours is promiselivinglibrary.blogspot.com. But um, I haven't done very much. I will probably be much more active in my blog when my children are graduated because the purpose of this blog is to... Um, help promote living books whenever I have my library open. So, hey there, Leah. So great to see you. But mostly you can find me on Instagram. That's that's where you find me most. So, I just in, told them about the Charlotte Mason Show Facebook group and that you ask people to put their periscopes and a lot have been saying what they're going to post about nature studies. So, I'm looking forward to seeing all of those nature study scopes. So, that's my welcome, and I wanted to give a couple of shout-outs, because there's just so many. Hi there. <laughs> um, I watched, this morning during breakfast, I watched scopes that I missed yesterday, and one of them, um, one of them, Jen Pepito, I don't know how to say her last name. She said she used to scope a lot and she just got on and I'm so glad I called it. It was so cool. They live on a farm in California and she had goats to show and was sharing edible plants and um, her children were milking the goat and it was just, just a fun, fun nature post. And she's still on the live replay right now, this one, Baby Goats and Edible Plants. So try to catch... That one, I don't know if she's on catch, so. And then yesterday was Leah's um, post, top 10 tips for winning with nature study. That was so much fun. Very fun, great tips. Um, so make sure you catch all of hers. And then Allison Winter did the Nature Pile Exchange 
post yesterday. I think she did that one and explained. She's explained about nature pile exchange a couple of posts, but yesterday it was specific just for that. And you can also um, find nature pile exchange on Instagram. Beautiful, beautiful feed. If you're on Instagram make sure, and you like nature, make sure you, you follow them. So that's my shout outs for today. Um, oh, I was, I wanted to get on, good, I wanted to get on earlier today, but as I was looking for pulling things together to talk about it, it just became overwhelming, and I decided that I will have to do future nature study posts. I started pulling out books, and I had a, a armful, and I said, I can't do all that in one post, so I, I plan to do a post specific on some living books about nature study, and then another one about how we nature journal. Everybody does it differently. Um, Leah shared how they did theirs. Allison shared how she did hers. And it has um, fluctuated throughout the years of our homeschooling journey. And right now we're at a comfortable place. And um, I'm just going to share that. We actually use watercolor pencils right now. Instead of, you know, dry brush, I haven't delved into that. Um, I was very slow to put color into my nature journals because I'm colorblind, but that's a whole nother story. So I'll do that for a future post. So today, hey there, um, so many of my Instagram friends are on here, and that's another reason why I love um, Periscope. So hello. So today I just wanted to share my personal story of how nature study became such a big part of my own life. There's something on my screen. Um, I'm going to try to not get emotional, but it's going to be difficult. Um, I grew up here in North Carolina. I spent a lot of my childhood up north in Maine as well, and I was always outdoors. I remember begging my mother, can I go outside, can I go outside? And I was the youngest of five children, but I was so far behind the other ones that, um, you know, I, I was seven years behind all four of them. And so I didn't have the sibling playmate all the time to go outside with me. So my mom was like, oh, wait till I can go outside. But um, when we were in Maine, I had free roam of my grandparents' yard, and that was that was wonderful. And then when we visited my father's home place, I had free roam out in the country in North Carolina. So I remember just loving the outdoors. But these two people right here influenced me more than anybody else. This is my daddy and his sister, my aunt. Now, funny story, my aunt was a public school science teacher for over 25 years and I was in her class in seventh grade <laughs> and I nobody knew she was my aunt it was our little secret and it was the most wonderful science class I ever ever took in public school because she is a some people are just drawn to nature and she's she's one of those so I would call her Whenever I got older, whenever I was married, and how are you doing? Her name is Cornelia. We call her Aunt Aunt Cory. I said, "Hey, Aunt Cory, how are you doing?" And she would commence to tell me about every squirrel, every bird, every creature that was outside of her back door, and would tell me what they were doing. Oh, this squirrel is doing this, and and this bird is doing that, and and um. Whenever I was younger and we were outside, both of them would hear a bird and they'd start whistling the tune and like communicating with the birds. They never sat me down and said, here's a picture of the Bob White and this is what it sounds like. But just being around them, they just grew up in a time where you just learned the birds outside and you learned them by call. And so they knew all of our area birds by the sound of their call and even now I go on walks with with Aunt Cory and she comes over and she said let's just go see what's in your neighborhood 
and we walk around and she can hear the birds and oh well there's some finches over there and there's the cat bird over there and um I'm learning some of that. I don't know near as much as they do did do and did. My father's no longer with me. But um you know, I feel like that I am able to pass that along to my own grandchildren now. Yes, it is it's great. So that was my beginnings and I wanted to share some pictures. My aunt would also rescue birds that were injured and she would bring them to the house. This little fat chubby baby is my now 19 year old and this little chubby girl is now 20. She would bring them over and let the children feed them and this is her, this is, <laughs> this is my now 25 year old son who's married and expecting his first child. They're looking over at the, at the birds. And she would do this often, at least once a year, she'd have a rescued bird to, sh to show us. So, um, oh, I love this one. Little fat face feeding the birds. So she helped instill in me the desire to share with my own children. So, um, you know, that is how I began to notice and to love nature and the wildlife around me. So whenever I started homeschooling um, and I heard about Charlotte Mason, is several things resonated with me. Yes, we've had a bird before only one and we accidentally killed it but that's that's another story um we we might try again it was just a little parakeet but um i would take my children on nature walks that the the nature study was one of the things that drew me to um charlotte mason the nature study living books and the atmosphere I think are the biggest things that drew me to Charlotte Mason, but this is an old picture of my children. We'd get all old camouflage. They just thought they had to be in camouflage if they were out in the woods. Um, and we'd go hiking and exploring anywhere we could for nature study. And then we were blessed to have a neighbor right next door. We've been in this home for um, 13 years and she would take them out in her garden and they would, my daughter became very knowledgeable about, you know, garden flowers and plants and things like that just by working with our neighbors. And then we also have contributions. I have a lot of um, bones and so forth that we've collected and only because our cats would bring us presents. So I have a few bird skulls thanks to my cat. Anyway, that's just a little funny story about my collection. I'll show you one of them. So that is how I was instilled with the love and uh, I was fed the, um, the curiosity. You know, the curiosity of nature and studying the natural world. And um, it was not only, you know, look at the birds and look at the squirrels, but it was always pointing towards the creator to you know, that, that God gave us this wonderful world in which to live in. And we see, I can't look at a bird, a woodpecker, and not think how amazing, you know, God is because of the creation. So, um, you know, you, you see them and you observe them and then you read something about them and it just gets more amazing the more you learn about nature. Yes, it really is. And I hope to be able to do the same thing for my children and my grandchildren and homeschool friends and families along the way. Oh, I'll also share in a future post when it gets warm enough to go outside. Our nature collection has grown and we actually have an outdoor building that we've stored some, some things in. And I invite homeschool families over here and they always leave with something for their nature collection. You know, if they're, if they're interested and they want something, I, they do not leave this house without something in their hands to put into their own nature collection. And that's, that's something I really enjoy doing. So I collect a lot, 
and some things I would not give away, <laughs> but a lot of things I collect just so that I can give them away to other um, to other families. So, oh, Leah, I'm glad you're on here because you were talking about, um, oh, I'll show you some. I'll show you a few things. I have bags and bags of seashells. I have some shark's teeth. I have, you know, we talked about pine cones, a ridiculous amount of pine cones, but each pine cone is is beautiful and unique and um, a small child can love a pine cone. I have a few um, robin's nests. A lot of them get kicked out of the tree and I find them on the ground. I have a lot of those sanitized and put in plastic bags if they're interested in a nest to send home with them. Um, yes, yeah, so feathers, you know, different things. They, they'll go home with something. And um, on your post last night, you were talk, or was it the one before? I don't, whichever one you were talking about, nature lore and like the, um, I, okay, that's a good question. My science teacher aunt told me to put them in a big Ziploc bag and spray them with Lysol and seal it up and I just leave it, forget about it for a few weeks. You just got to make sure that any mites or anything living in there doesn't get oxygen and has time to to die. You could also um, put them in a big plastic bag, spray it with Lysol, close it, eat freezer, put things in the freezer. We'll also sanitize things, but that might be a little gross. If you have an outdoor freezer or something, maybe. Um, yes, Lysol will do that. So um, we'll kill the mites. And there's some nests you don't want because some nests, after the babies are born, they poop all over it. You don't want those nests, but Robin's nests are pretty neat. They have the mud bottom, and um, I have a nest. We you have to pull if you have a bird, bluebird's nest. You have to. Um, it's fine. It's fine. Take your time. If you have a bluebird's box, you're supposed to clean those out before every spring, so that the bird can, the smaller birds can re-nest in it. So. Um, you know, they're this, you know, this square size. So I look at the thrift store and find these glass um, square containers that are about the same size. And there's one that we, we took it out of the, the nest. We took it out of the box with the spatula and it stayed together and we slid it right down into this glass container. And you can see all the way around how the nest was built. And I'll show that one. That one's out in the nature hut and I'll show that one when the weather warms up. But what's so neat is that you can see our hair is in that nest because when my daughter-in-law cuts our hair, if it's warm, we go outside and we just sweep the hair right into the flower bed. And the birds have been using that. We know the birds have been using our hair because you can pick it out and you can see because, you know, no, oh, that's, you know, Alex and Amelia's hair. Or that's, that's my hair. So that's really neat. It's a neat, that's something I would keep for a long time. <laughs> so, um, but most of, most of my nests are outside. Yes. Yes. If you, if people cut your hair at the house, put it out there for the birds. Um, I wanted to show, we talked about nature lore and I, did, I have a lot of the Burgess books and I did not know he wrote one called nature lore and I just thought that was neat that you were just you were explaining what Charlotte Mason meant by nature lore and here's this this book of nature lore by Thornton Burgess and it's basically a story of some children and their adventures and what they see pretty little old-timey illustrations so Yes, it was a thrift store find. Oh, no, this was a, a library discard. That's that's where I got this one. And um, I'll go ahead and share. <laughs> I think it was a, a, a chickadee that actually used the hair because that's what was nesting in that box. We have the Carolina chickadees here. Um, I just have a couple of books to share because I can't do a scope without sharing a book. This is another one. Look, library discard. Isn't that sad? Um, see through the forest. It's just falling apart. But it's the sweetest little story. Um, it tells about the different layers of the forest in a, in a story form. They call underneath the basement. And then 
the um, then they go to the to the ground floor of the forest, and it's saying you know what you might see, and it's it's a very easy. It's called See Through the Forest. And let me get the title. Let me finish showing, and then I'll find the title page. And then they go up to the to the top of the trees, like the upstairs. So it's just it's just beautiful. Let me find the title page if it hasn't been ripped out. This is a very here. Oh, one of my favorite authors. I should have known. One of my favorite little science. She writes a lot of the I can read science books. Millicent Salesman. So, you know, little stories like this I like to um, collect. And the last one, I'm, I'm just sharing these sort of odd books. There's a lot of books that are shared over and over again that are wonderful books. But if you can't find those, I just want to encourage you to go to your thrift stores, go to your library sales, and just open some books and start reading them. And you can find wonderful nature study books, living nature books, that may not be on any homeschool list at all. And it may be perfect for what you need for your family. You don't have to do the Burgess Bird book like everybody else. The author was Millicent Salesman, the same one that writes a lot of the um, I Can Read Science books. I'll show you the title page again because, yes, Sel, S -E -S -S -E -L -S -A -M. maybe I'm not saying it right, Selsum, yes, there, um, but encourage you to, you know, go look for, if you can't find the book that everybody else is reading, go find your own and your family will like it. This is one that I found at an antique store called Nature's Program. And it made me think of the, the concept of the book of first that Charlotte Mason talks about doing, the calendar of first. And what it does is it goes through each month of the year, and then there's a little very well-written description of what you might see. Yes, secondhand treasures, what you might see in the first of March. And it's, it reminds me a lot of the handbook of nature study. There's quotes and little poems and like I'll just read you the first sentence out of the march it says for the nature lover march is truly the dawn of the year even in its first days when patches of snow still cover the ground in the woods you will be quite likely to come upon the very first blossom of the spring you might find it even in the first week of this month piercing the melting snow in a boggy spot I love that word and then it goes on and it shows you um it has descriptions of some of the things that you'd see, a little bit more scientific. But as a guide, I just like pulling this out and, and looking every now and then at the month that we're in. And it just it just makes me remember to, to you know, keep on looking and keep on watching. So before I show you the um, where I have some of my indoor nature stuff, I, want to share a historical artifact. Um, good, good, catch the replay. I want to share a historical artifact with almost every scope that I do. I've been thinking about it and I keep on forgetting. But um, this is something that my grandparents used. Does anybody know what this is? And it has to do with nature and planting. If anybody knows what this is. I don't know the real name for this. I have a made-up name for this. But this is the stick that they would use to drop down into the ground when they were planting their garden to make the hole to plant the seeds. I don't know what it's called, but this is they, they just it's real slick. You can tell they just go along. I've seen longer ones that people would stand up and someone would fall behind them. But this is when you had to be down on the ground and just drop it into the dirt and it would make the hole for the seeds. I do not know what this is called. I'm almost embarrassed to say, hey Allison, I was sharing, I'll go ahead and tell you, this is my historical artifact for the day. This is a little wooden thing that my grandparents used to use to plant their garden. They would drop it down into the ground and it would make 
the hole that they needed to plant their seeds. So I do not know the real name for this and I'm embarrassed to share what I call it, but I'm going to keep it real here. I call this the, the wooden turd. <laughs> so with a mom of boys, that's, that makes them laugh and that's what, that's what we call it. <laughs> so, um, I have not done the research to know what they call it. I don't remember what my aunt called it, but this is what my grandparents used. And I have a, <laughs> I have a couple of these around the house. Yes. So, but isn't that neat? You, you know, you'd see this somewhere and think it's just, it's nothing, but it's, it's very slick and worn from use. So it's, I keep it on my mantle. <laughs> yes. Yes. They'll know what I'm talking about. I keep it on my mantle in my, in my bedroom. <laughs> So, okay, I'm going to, I don't have any help today. I'm actually in the house alone, um, which is very, very unique for me. Um, so I'm going to attempt to carry the iPad and show you some of my favorite treasures. So let me get this and turn this around. So this is my little stand that I put the iPad on as a toy. Um, this is, we call this the science buffet. Um, yes, we use old dining room furniture for school stuff. And I'll share one of my favorite finds first. I think I told in another scope that I had found some well, watch the replay. Watch the replay. Um, I had found some owl pellets. I saw my very first great horned owl a couple of years ago whenever I was working at a history museum. And we got the owl pellets and um, put them in a, a bag and sanitized them the way I said we did, did the nest. And then we opened them up and got all of these... Um, bone fragments inside of the owl pellets. So sometimes we pull them out on a tray and try to decide is that from a bird's rib or a part of a skull or a wing. And then these in this jar are the feathers that were on the ground underneath the owl's nest. So you see baby owl lit feathers like little fluffy down and then the feathers of the bird that was probably eaten as well so that's that's one of my most treasured finds because it's the experience I remember the experience so well and I feel like that now I have a very strong connection with the great horned owl in fact I would basically stalk the poor thing and walk um, I'll flip it around while I talk for I would stalk the poor um, owl and, um, oh good, and I remember looking in my binoculars, way up, craning my neck way up in the tree to see this owl, and I have a vivid memory of the two great big owl eyeballs staring at me back through the binoculars. It is something I will never forget, never forget. So, <laughs> yes, it was, it was so great. And I had, I had read that um, the owls don't like it when you're around them. And um, I had read a story from a man in 1920, in the 1920s, that was a naturalist that was looking for owls. And he climbed up the tree so he could peek into the nest. Like, why would you do that? But he did. And the owl came by and f hit him on the head. So <laughs> I was very, very wary of the owl, even though I was looking at him and, and enjoying him, I was still trying to be very careful. Yes, I didn't want to get attacked by this beautiful, wonderful creature. So um, let me flip this back around. I have a very dear friend. She's a friend on Instagram who goes to Sanibel Island every year, and she brings back so many treasures, and she is so gracious to share. And I, she, is, she has given me so much that I have put together 52 bags of shells to give away to, to um, homeschool children who come. So these are some of my beach, some of, the, some of my favorite shells. 
Yes. Yeah, now I don't live in Sanibel, and I didn't actually collect some of these. Some of these I did, but um, because they were given to me with such love by, by another fellow amateur naturalist, you know, they're part of my treasures. And then we talked about this this book and your scope, the um, Edwardi. I know you know which one this is. Sanibel Island is off the coast of Florida is off the coast of Florida. Now I am going to show you, oh Allison, I have a printer's tray but it's not as full as yours and we can't, because we live in an old house, we can't hook it to the um, wall because of the plaster so it has to hang so I have to like plasti tack my stuff in there so it doesn't fall out. So um, I just have that, it's not full. Eventually it will be full. So now I'm going to open my very favorite drawer in the whole entire house and this is this is my nature drawer this is mine this is this is more mine than the children but they do help me and I can't pull it out all the way or it will fall, fall out because it is an antique buffet ta-da so another copy the little paperback copy because this is the one I pull out and throw in my my bag Yes, so many people have accused me of that, Allison, having a nature museum. Now this is, I found out about these last year. This is a Appalachian um, berry basket, a small one. And they're made by the skins of um, tulip poplar trees. And someone made these. I bought this at a fiber festival. And these are little felted acorn wools I mean felted wool acorns but you can google um, Appalachian berry basket or Appalachian baskets or, or tulip poplar berry baskets and there's a girl that makes these in the Appalachian Latchin mountains and she does a video of how she makes these um, it's very 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 interesting they would use them. It's got the bend in it so whenever they needed to make a basket when they were tramping through the woods to collect berries they could slice some of the um, bark off the tree and make the basket right there. This is another one of my favorite favorite finds. It is a gray fox skull. Found that when walking and for cleaning skulls for learning about how to take care of bones and clean bones and skulls you need to go to a site called Jake's Bones if somebody wants to type that in yes Allison buy the book buy two of them you're gonna want more than one Sunday's gonna want one when she grows up probably um, so go to a site called Jake's Bones about um, learning how to take and this one I actually glued together I glued the teeth in no, no, do not bake it. Basically, all I do is soak them in hydrogen peroxide. Soak them in hydrogen peroxide. He has a very nice chart that tells you about, you know, what condition your bones in. I have not tried to clean bones that still have a good amount of flesh or hair on them. Most of the bones that I find mostly have just dirt and maybe a little bit of muscle mostly dirt so um, anyway and then another hint for I'm not supposed to have this so that's I can't share that um, a friend it's hard to do this <laughs> it's hard to do this because I can't see what I'm looking at this a friend gave me this and I'm gonna turn it into a quill pen she has um, I don't remember what kind of bird this is. I have to ask her and, and so I can commit it to my... Yes, exactly. Hide your eyes, nature police. <laughs> um, but isn't that a lovely feather? And then I wanted to share also for drying flowers. My friend shared a wonderful tip with me. This is a miniature rose. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Whoop. My, my Aunt Cory that I was telling you about earlier grows some of my grandmother's 
Yay, yay, thank you. Um, to dry flowers very easily, drop them in, whoops, clean, unused cat litter. And just sprinkle the cat litter in them and they will dry perfectly. So that's my little um, drying flowers hint. Now this is the picture that I just reposted on Facebook. This is a treasure to me because, yes, I do press flowers. I um, have a couple of flower presses, but some of them, I haven't had good, some of them just aren't good to press because, like, the middle of them is so fat that they're, it's not that great to press. But my son came home one day and said, here, Mom, I found this by the side of the road whenever I was taking a walk. And, you know, we have these in the streams around here and stuff. So I just had to, the little arm had fallen off, so I glued it back on. A glue E6000. Yes, that sounds fun. International retreat. E6000 is the type of glue I use to glue my nature finds together. And I think I have a few, um, these are the mallard duck leaves that my friend shared with me. So when children come over, and I'll pull this stuff out with my grandchildren, and, you know, we'll get the shells out, and I put these out in the summertime on the coffee table. So back here, when children come to visit, yay, we'll just watch the replay. When children come to visit, they get to pick a shark's tooth, because someone gifted me with a whole pile of shark's teeth, so thankfully I get to share those. They get to bring one home. And, yay, and, um, oh, Spanish moss. Some of the more, like, the, this wintel trap shell is very rare and hard to find, so I only have two of those. So this is just some of my my favorite thing, some, um, oh, what do you call this? Fossilized shells. This is something a lot of the children like, um, the, um, lightning whelk egg sac. And down in there you can see the baby shells that come out of it. And then I get to show them, they grow into this lightning whelk. So they get to see the see the baby, and they get to see it grown up, and there's another one. So we go through and I tell them all the names of the shells, and this is called a baby's ear. Doesn't it look like a baby's ear? And um, a turkey wing. When you start learning the names of shells... Thankfully, they're named after what they look like, a lot of them. And this is a cat's paw, or kitten paw. So that's just a little few of my favorite drawer in the house. And then I'm going to show you one more thing. Oh, I forgot to put the lid on. Yes, great names. <laughs> it took me quite a while to learn them, but those were the easiest. And I'm going to show you one more shelf. Oh, that's our... um. A friend gave me this, and I had a few specimens, and then we've been able to add on them over the years. And then a friend on Instagram, one year we have cicadas all over the place, but one year we couldn't find a complete bug, like we'd find partial. So a f Instagram friend sent me this from Arizona, and I sent her some of the shells because we were finding hundreds of the shells and then these are pine cones from Oregon they're so heavy so much different than ours so I love to have those out there so I can touch them but this is my other little shelf just a thrift store shelf but with some of my favorite finds and of course a picture of my my aunt showing me the birds but this nest um she gave me it has eight bluebirds in it and she watched this nest she watched this the bluebirds through her window they laid four eggs 
and then fro they froze over. We had a bad winter last year. Then she they laid four more eggs, and then it froze over, and she watched throughout the whole season, and the birds never came back. So then she had to clean out the, the nest so that it would be ready for next, the box would be ready for the next year, and she put it in this little basket and sanitized it for me and gave it to me. So it's one of my my treasures and you can see they're they're decaying it'll eventually all decay but until then I'll enjoy it and then these are just some bluebird feathers that we found after our cat killed a bluebird <laughs> and this is another nest if you have clear containers you can see what what's in the nest I'm not quite sure what bird built this nest but I have some random bluebird and killdeer and robin eggs and different eggs we found and they're just pieces and more random bones of things that my cats killed that we've cleaned and this is from a trip to Georgia with my best friend and some of the little things I picked up there so it's nice when you when you travel to, to bring some keepsake nature keepsakes home little things Oh, and this this is one of my favorite things, too. This is the molt. I hope nobody's scared of spiders. This is the molt of our pet tarantula that has since died. It was, it was getting pretty old, but our pet Rosie. It was very creepy to wake up one morning and see two tarantulas in the container, but it's, it's her complete molt. So that's one of our favorites. So that's that's just some of the things that I like to keep. I'm going to turn this around. Oh, that's that's just some seashells I put together and yeah, I I don't mind them. I don't like rats. Leah, rats are where I draw the line. You know, spiders, snakes, that kind of stuff I don't mind, but this is just a little display I put together and labeled them when I started learning because that helped me and I had the children help me choose the prettiest ones and once you do a project like this, it'll help you remember the names better. So I'm going to, okay, oh, here's one more thing. This is that's new, new to us with the wood burning. We've been um, cutting discs of wood so we can do wood burning projects, and I am going to label what type of tree it is on the back of it so that this is, this is what um, my grandson plays with when I read him science stories, and it's, his little frog because the story that we're reading the little chipmunk is meeting a frog so he had to go get the right animals out so anyway so that's just a little bit of some of my favorite it's so fun to share um, share my treasures like this so um, so much fun to share my treasures now when I go outside to my nature hut when it gets warmer. I might have to do that in two posts because there's just, I just, I, you can tell I get excited about it and just forget about time and, and just like to share. So anytime people come to my house, I'm doing the same thing. Do you want to see my gray fox skull? <laughs> so um, I do hope that this scope in, has encouraged, will encourage people to, um, you know, just, just get outside. If nothing else, just get outside and enjoy God's wonderful creation. Um, there was something else I wanted to say, and my, my mind is blank. Oh, I before I got on here, yes, um, I think I'm going to have a shell workshop for my homeschool group and invite the families over and just set up the tables and let them handle the shells and tell them the names of them and send them home with a bag of shells. That's, that's my hope. I didn't get to it last summer, but hopefully I can do it this summer. Um, I talked to my now 20 year old daughter this morning and I was asking her, I said, do you, do you, um, know any of the names of birds? And she said, mother, not like you do. And I said, I said, but do you like birds? She said, yeah, I like birds. I said, do you feel like that, because she was my um, 
first and only child to go through our homeschool all the way through, 100% from, from start to finish. And I was learning so much through it all. Um, my older two boys did public school, then homeschool, then public school, so it was different for them. And I said, but at least do you feel like that you have an appreciation for God's creation? Do you feel like you, um, you know, you're drawn to the outdoors? And she said, absolutely, absolutely. I love the mountains. I like hiking. I like the health benefits of being outdoors. So, you know, she did not grow up to become a enthusiastic naturalist. But she did grow up to have an appreciation of God's creation and of the outdoors. So I was, um, just to see if anything at all stuck with her, I was showing her flashcards of birds. It was like, do you know what this one is? Please, do you know what this one is? It's blue. That's a hit. <laughs> so she did know four or five birds. But um, every child is different, and some children will naturally be drawn to nature and nature study more than others. My grandson, who I school every day, is six. We can't stop looking out the windows at the birds, and we are distracted all day long because of the birds, and he already knows how to identify about every... Oh, go ahead, type it in. He knows how to identify every bird in our yard, and none of my children ever had that much. And it might have been me, um, because I wasn't that far along my... um knowledge journey too but um everybody's different but everybody can get something out of studying god's creation so does he have his question ready anytime that you you how did you catch the tarantula without getting hurt this was we got this from a fellow homeschool Yes, that's my grandson. He, like, gets excited about everything. I think he caught my nature bug. But, okay, so the tarantula, we were, it was a pet for another homeschool family, and her son was joining the Navy, and his little sisters did not want to take care of the pet anymore, so they gave it, gave Rosie to us, and we had her for about five years. And she was a gentle tarantula, but as much as I like spiders, I still wanted to, um, not stress her out. So we would take a mason, when we had to clean her, jar, clean her cage, we would take a mason, big mason jar, and let her crawl in it, and then put a plate over it and take her out, and then do what we needed to in her cage, and then put her back out. Now my son did handle her, and he never got bit, but he is our resident animal charmer. Um, I like animals, but a little bit of my natural nervousness might show through with them, but he is calm as a cucumber when it comes to animals. He does all the um, clipping of the cat's nails, and when we had the bird, he um, clipped the bird's wings, and he um, took care of any. We went through all the hermit crab, hamster, all that kind of stage, got that out of the way where they had to have those. Now we're down to just cats, so... Our pets are very easy to take care of now. We just have cats. Um, but anyway, that's just a little bit of my story of how I became to... Oh. Um, how I became to be so enthusiastic about nature. It started a long time ago when I was a little girl. And a little bit of our treasures. So anything that you make a connection with... Um, and that you have a story when you're observing, you know, bring home and collect. And the children, the children would do that too. We have, um, outside, we have an outside collection for, um, the out, like we have bark and pine cones and rocks, you know, cause they, they collect so much of that. We just keep it out on our porch. Um, I don't know. I might be able to, let me see if I can see. It's very windy outside, so I don't want to go outside, but, um. I might be able to show. Oh, you can't see it. It's, they have a little picnic table out on the porch and crates full of rocks and acorns and leaves and bark. And they play cook and play house and um, shoot acorns with their slingshots. And, you know, they, they enjoy nature in a lot of different ways. Um, well, I'm going to sign off here and remember to catch the, um, this girl's post about the baby goats and edible plants. Oh, wow. I love snow. 
I love snow. We're in the middle. We are, it's about 55 today, very windy, but the sun fi finally came up. And um, I live in a very old house, a Victorian house, so um, I wear wool inside. We talked about wool a little bit on your show, Leah. I have learned the value of, of wool, of natural fibers, just from being inside, much less outside. But make sure you catch um, the Charlotte Mason show with Leah. She does some wonderful posts about Charlotte Mason education. Yes, a Victorian home. Someone asked for a... Um, house tour sometime. We might we might do that one day. Um, I won't show you my boys' rooms. Mm. You don't want to see those. <laughs> um, and then Allison with the Nature Pile Exchange and her the Nature Pile Exchange feed on Instagram is is wonderful if you like nature. So that's my shout outs and I'm going to sign off and and fix me some tea and work on some planning because I still have the house to myself, which is strange. My boys are going off helping my husband um, collect some wood and my daughter's gone to work and my grandchildren are gone and I'm just by myself. So it was nice spending time with you today and I will hope to see a lot of you on Periscope soon. Yes. Thank you for watching. I'm so glad you got to watch. I'm so glad you got to to see it. So, did I answer your question enough for your son about the about Rosie the tarantula? I think I did. I think I covered it. Yes. All right. Well, goodbye, y'all. I'm gonna turn y'all. I say y'all and you guys. It comes out both ways. I'm gonna turn this camera around and. Um, Sign off.